Well, thank you all for coming tonight. This is going to be cool. This is different, and I like different. Uh, we'll mix it up a little bit. This is my third year coming here, and uh, every year I enjoy it uh, more and more. Of course, um, I love Casey and Nate and their family, but I've grown to have a heart for this area, and it's hard not to. This is one of the prettiest places I think there is in the whole country. But your, your hills freak me out a little bit because I'm from Indiana where it's just all flat. So when we get around here and Blake's going fast in the car and it's rainy, I'm like, Blake, just pump the brakes a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But we had angels with us because we made it. Uh, we've been on the go, on the go, on the go. I preached a revival in West Palm Beach. And uh, before that, I was in Uganda and Fiji and then a crusade in San Antonio, then West Palm Beach. And then I got home. And the Lord just put it on my heart to go to Houston. You know everything that's going on in Houston right now. And so uh, Blake was wild enough to just jump in the car with me. And we went down and did our part, what we could, a small part, just to love on people down there in Houston. And that was an eye opener. And, and man, oh man, if, uh, if you need something to add to your prayer list, and I'm sure most of you already are praying, but continue to pray for the people of Houston. And uh, then from there... Uh, we preached last night, Blake did music, I preached in New Jersey, and it was an outdoor revival, and it rained like crazy, but the people still stayed out there with the, their umbrellas. I don't know what the Lord's trying to tell me about rain, but everywhere I'm going, it's raining, and it, this is the first day it's rained here in a while, isn't that right? So we brought the rain with us, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Franklin Graham, during the inauguration of President Trump said that rain is a blessing and I wondered last night when everyone was getting soaked and we were trying to preach the gospel was he right about that I don't know if this is a blessing right now but we still pressed forward people got saved and it was awesome and now I'm here with you fine folks tonight in a different type of setting more of an intimate setting just hanging and this is cool my heart anytime I go anywhere is simple uh, you see it on the shirts Jesus 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 till the day I die it's simple. I just plan on telling people about Jesus, more Jesus, and then more Jesus until the day that he takes me home. And then I'll get to be with Jesus, which I'm looking forward to that time. And my heart and hope in sharing Jesus with people is this. I want people to not only uh, be forgiven of the sins in their life and have a home in heaven when they leave this world, which we're all going to leave this world, but also to live a life of purpose here and now. I think so many people say, yeah, you know what, I'll raise my hand for Jesus and then I'll live life for me and then one day I'll slip into heaven. And it just doesn't work like that. Uh, it's more than just salvation. It's a process of sanctification where you become more like Jesus and the life that you live. And that doesn't mean you're going to be perfect after salvation. Just, it just means that when you do fall down, you get back up because His grace is abundant and it's new and you continue to follow Him. So my heart is to see salvations. And my heart is for people, and uh, my heart is for all of you. So thank you so much for coming tonight, and Nate and Casey and everyone, thank you for having me again, third year. They must not be able to find anybody else. They're just like, third year, we'll have you back. You're a glutton for punishment, wherever you are. Thank you, bro. Um, we're going to jump into the Word tonight, because I don't know anything else to do than to jump into the Word. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to this passage with me. If not, you can follow along. And I know the millennials will be like, we just will open our iPads up. And you can do that. Just don't play Angry Birds or anything. And if someone is, call them out. And then we'll rebuke it in Jesus' name. But I want you to turn to a passage that I think is, is very interesting. And um, it's the passage, if I can find it. Um, it's the passage, you know what, we're not, we're not going to do this one tonight, I don't think. I think that the Lord might be telling me to go a different direction. Um, let's just pray before, before we jump into this. Lord, I pray tonight that, that you lead me where you want me to go, and I sense that it's not what I originally had planned. And so, Lord, I pray that you take me there, and I pray, Lord, that you speak through me, and that people who have come here tonight leave with a better understanding of you. Uh, I pray that people who don't know you who have come tonight leave knowing you, as their personal savior and i pray that in this room tonight that the holy spirit would just fall on us and that we would have an experience with you that is undeniable i pray that you bring people to yourself bring them to salvation and i pray lord for a revival that stirs here in woodstock in jesus name amen, amen. well let me do something real quick and then we'll jump into this is that cool uh, what i'd like you to do instead 
is this. Um, turn to the book of John chapter 4. I was going to take you to the book of Micah, but instead I'm going to ask you to, to go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. This is an interesting text. I've preached this text a few times over the course of the last couple of years, especially to younger audiences, but I think it might be fitting here tonight. Um, has a lot to do with water in John chapter 4, and we're seeing water out there and water all around and water in Houston. Um, my, what I've come to find out traveling around and meeting people um, of all denominations, of all skin colors, of all ages, uh, of all you know, statures as far as finances are concerned, I was in Uganda and Fiji meeting people in both of those places. And then this week, uh, Houston, New Jersey, and now you. I found that we really are all the same. Now, we would be told that it's our humanity that makes us the same. And I would go one step beyond that and say that it's not necessarily our humanity that ties us all together and makes us the same. But it's our sin nature that makes us all the same from birth. Uh, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we are all sinners. That's what makes us the same. At birth, we are, we are birthed into a fallen world. My wife's pregnant right now. We're about to have a little girl really any day now. So I keep checking my phone. I'm like, when do I need to catch a flight back? Um, it, we think the, the due date's the 1st of October, but we believe the baby's going to come early. The, the signs are pointing that way from the doctor. But I know even that little girl, she will enter, enter into the world as a sinner. I know that. I love her with all my heart already, but I know that. Why? Because it's passed down from her mom and I. It's in her DNA. We are born into a fallen world. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So that's what makes us the same. And so you, you, you take the fact that we're all sinners, right, and that ties us together. But you can go a step further with that. Because we have sin in our lives, we also have a need. So not only does our sin make us the same, our need also ties us together. We all need something. Now you'll talk to some people to say, you know what, man, I need a job. Um, I need a new house. People in Houston, we need help from the flooding. I need this and I need that. And we all have needs in one way or another. But the greatest need that anyone ever has in their life, whether they acknowledge it or not, is a need to be forgiven of their sins. A need to be made new with God. That's the greatest need that any of us have. The problem is that most people never acknowledge that need. They don't ever consider that need. Instead, they pay attention to physical needs and needs of this life, and they consume themselves with that. And what they're trying to do is fill the void in their own life, right? You know, I need a better job to make more money. I need a nicer car. I need a, 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 a new relationship. And that's why we see marriages fall apart. I need this. I need this. I need this. I need that. But if you started at the core of the need and the need was Jesus, because he's the only one that can fig forgive you of your sins, everything else in your life would begin to line up. But if you don't start at the root, the tree will never grow properly. So we all have sin, and because of it, we all have a need. And I know some, some, some of you old Christian scholars are like, man, cookies are really on the lower shelf right now with what you're talking about. That's how I like to present it, just as simple as possible. That's how Jesus did it. I want people to get it just as simple as possible because we do such a good job in America today of either watering it down or trying to jazz it up. To You know, Paul said it's not in his eloquent words, just the power of the gospel. And that's what I want this to be tonight. So I want you to know something. We all have a need. We're sinners. And because we're sinners, we have a need to be forgiven of that sin. So check this out. John chapter 4. And if you want to turn there, it's okay. John chapter 4, verse 7. This is my traveling Bible. I've had three Bibles stolen over the last year and a half at revivals. That's an interesting thing to steal. A Bible. But I figure if they take it, they need it more than I do. So this is my Bible for right now until this one gets stolen. I've got my eyes on you, so don't take it. <laughs> John chapter 4, verse 7. This is what said. It says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. So let's just look at this verse real quick. And I hope that it comes alive in a new way to you. Uh, here you have a woman, right? And she's a Samaritan woman. And we know that in that time, in that portion of history, that women were considered second-class citizens. 
Uh, a man didn't speak to his wife in public, let alone any other woman. They were considered uh, not in, in equal standing as a man would be. So you have a woman, so she's second class in their eyes in that time. And sadly enough, that's still the case overseas right now. And if I could say this, I think it's interesting that people in America today, you know, cry out for rights and rights and rights. But the, the, the cry for their rights overseas is rarely ever spoken about. If we really cared about people, shouldn't we care about them all around the world and try to help them there? But here's the thing. So she's also a Samaritan woman. And if you knew anything about history at that time, Jewish people and Samaritan people didn't get along. They hated one another. It, they were enemies. They're enemies. And that's why we find out in the story of the Good Samaritan, what's so shocking is that the Good Samaritan in that story is a Samaritan man that helps the Jewish man. Jesus is saying, love your neighbor looks like loving your enemies. And so he sets up the story again here. The scripture does. And we find out that here's this woman and she comes to draw water. And I want you to know this, that it wasn't by coincidence or chance that she shows up to draw water. God already had orchestrated all of this. And sometimes in your life, doing the most simple thing is when God will move in the most extraordinary way. And some people believe I have to go to this great Christian concert and conference to have an experience with God, or I got to go stand on a mountain. Man, he'll meet with you wherever you're at, even in this room, even in your living room. Sometimes doing the most simple things is where God moves. And this is where he moves right here because she's just going to get a drink. She has no idea that her life is about to be rocked forever. You say, I know this story. I want you to look at it with fresh eyes, though. It says this in verse 9. We see in verse 8 that the disciples had gone away. So we know now that it's just Jesus and the woman. And then in verse 9, it says, The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, for I am a woman of Samaria? Remember, I just told you that Jews hated Samaritans. Men didn't talk to women. And here you have Jesus breaking every single rule. Everyone says, Jesus was a rule keeper. You don't know Jesus then. Jesus was a rule breaker, and he did it for his father's glory. And I love the fact that he broke rules. Why? Because he had the power to make the rules in the first place. He makes them and he breaks them, and that's how God operates. His ways are not our ways. So he comes up and he just says, yo. Yo is not in there. It might be in the Clayton translation. You don't want to read that one. And so he comes to her. And he says, give me a drink. And he's starting a conversation. So then she says, how is this, right, that you're talking to me? And I like the fact that she's just like me. Sometimes God will move in your life and you don't even see it. So you want to go to the practical. And when you go to the practical, you're missing the spiritual every time. She goes right to the practical. How is it that you're coming to talk to me when you're a man, I'm a woman, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan? And she has no idea that he's not even looking at the practical. He's focused on the spiritual, and he wants to touch her life. Don't shut out the spiritual movement of God in your life because you'll miss his blessings every time. Be open to those things. And she begins to understand as Jesus talks to her. Verse 10, Jesus said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So Jesus, in essence, is saying what I just said. You missed out. Uh, you're missing out on the spiritual because you're focused on the practical. And Jesus is saying, it, really, if you knew the gift of God, and, and Scripture tells us time and time again outside of this passage that the gift of God is one thing. It's Jesus. Who is the gift of God? Jesus. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He sent Jesus. He sent. It was a, you send a gift. He sent Jesus. Jesus is the gift to the world. And so what he's saying is, if you knew the gift of God, which is me standing right in front of you talking to you, you wouldn't ask me these silly questions about social norms, rules, and regulations. You wouldn't ask me about these. Instead, you would fall on your face and you'd give me your life. And, and I have to tell you tonight, even in this room right here, in a different type of setting. And I got to tell you, this is so refreshing to me. I love this, just hanging with you guys. I feel like I'm back in youth group again. This is cool. <laughs> <clears throat> but I'll tell you that even in your life, uh, when God moves like this and he says to you, stop focusing on the little things in life because you're missing out on the big things I'm doing. You have to listen to him. He's always at work in your life one way or another. And even in this room right here, if you saw Jesus, which I believe he's here. The Bible says two more gathered together, he's there. I believe that God is in this place right now. I believe through the presence of his spirit, he's here. 
And if you could see that for one second, right now we see each other. We see the walls. You see me up here. You see Blake back there. But if you, for one second, could just have the veil of your human eyes pulled back, and for one second, boom, you could see the spiritual realm happening in this room right now. The fight, literally, between good and evil, angels and demons, life and death. I could just close the Bible and I could say, who wants to give their life to Jesus? And all of you would just say, me or those you know Jesus would say, man, I got to get busy telling other people. But in America, what I found is that we're so comfortable that we're almost asleep. When I preached in Uganda, we saw God move in ways that I've never seen before. And I grew up in a pastor's home and five generations of preachers and been around the world and seen things I've never seen God move like what we saw in Uganda. And some people say, we don't believe those things happen. Well, the Pharisees didn't believe the things that they saw Jesus do. But we saw Jesus move there. We saw people in incredible ways be touched by the power of God. And I kept wondering, why is it that, that over here, like, it's almost tangible, like the spiritual realm. And then it just hit me because they're not asleep. They're not comfortable. When you get comfortable on the couch, you fall asleep, right? You are not comfortable when you don't know where your next meal is going to come from. You're not comfortable when you see people around you dying of diseases and there's no medicine. You are not comfortable. Instead, all you think about is life and death and trying to live one more day. And when you live in that realm, all you can think about is the spiritual. You have to cry out to God for his help. I mean, the Bible says if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. There are mountains that get moved over there through faith. And we see God move in powerful ways. Why? Because they have that faith. I don't think we have that in America because we are so comfortable. We're asleep. Jesus says, wake up. I've got great things, and I want to do them in your life, through your life. I was on a plane recently. Well, uh, uh, not recently, kind of a while back. I was flying back to America, and I met a man that, on the plane next to me, and I asked him what he did for a living. He said, I'm a missionary. And I said, oh, no way. And we began to talk, and I said, so where are you stationed? Who's your church? You coming back on furlough? And he said, no, 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 I'm coming to America. I'm a missionary being sent to America to tell the Americans about Jesus. And I was so convicted, and I thought, isn't that the truth? And we think we have to go overseas to, to win people to Christ. Man, there's a battlefield right here right now. And just like Nate said, it's time we stand up and we move forward by the power of God. And so what happens is Jesus says, if you knew who's sitting here before you, you wouldn't be talking about petty things. Instead, you'd give me your life. And the woman all of a sudden has a stirring inside where you can tell that it's coming alive a little bit. And in verse 11, she says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Again, she's stuck in the literal. And I would be too. Uh, if Jesus came and just talked to me, I, would th I think I'd miss out on a lot of the truth he's speaking because every word he says is layered with truth. You ever just study the red letters of the Bible? I mean, you could spend a whole series on just each sentence Jesus spoke. He never talked for the sake of talking. Everything he said was laced with truth. Everything he said had a deeper meaning. And it has a deeper meaning here. The, the problem is, though, this lady just doesn't understand it yet. Again, she's focusing on the physical well and the water that's right there. And what Jesus is trying to do is use the well as a physical illustration to point to spiritual meaning. But she's not seeing the spiritual because she's so stuck on the physical. But then this is what happens. Uh, all of a sudden... Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again, because the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Again, Jesus is going straight to the gospel. He is an evangelist through and through. We don't often see Jesus as an evangelist. He was many things, but he was an evangelist. He's pointing people to the Father and saying, the only way to get to him is to come through me. And so Jesus is talking to her and says, listen, lady, you keep coming back to this well to drink water because you're thirsty. How many of you have drank today? Raise your hand. I'm talking about alcohol. I'm just, oh, uh, I saw she said, you, you pulled your hands down so quick. Not me, not me. I'm just playing with you. Bad joke, bad joke. How many of you drink anything today, any type of liquid, right? You're drinking something right now, brother. But here's the thing. After you finish that bottle of water, there's going to come a time later tonight or tomorrow, you'll be thirsty again. It's just a temporary quench. You know, we've been living on gas station food recently, Blake and I, and I'm excited about tonight because I've been told there's a good meal and I can count on that with my Vermont family out here. 
But every time, you know, we stop and we get a drink and we got to pull over you know, like 10 exits down because one of us is thirsty again or hungry again. Why? It just will never satisfy you. It's a temporary quench to a need. We talk about the need. And Jesus is talking about the spiritual, using the physical to bring it to life. And Jesus is saying this, the same way, lady, that you keep coming back and drinking this water, but it never fills you up because you got to come back again, is the same thing you're doing with your life, with sin. You keep coming back to empty wells and drinking empty things in this life. And every time you sin, it's a temporary fix to a problem that only Jesus can cover and change. You keep coming back to it, but it never fulfills you. One of the things I think is so interesting is that in, in not just America, and I don't mean to be down on America. I love America. And I pray that God brings a great revival here and uses our generation for a great awakening. And I believe that we're seeing stirrings of that. But what I think is so sad is that, you know, in a lot of people's eyes, the American dream is like fame, money, and youth. I mean, we worship youth. We disrespect our elders because, you know, there's, there's just, you know, there's, there's livelihood in youth. But no, there's not. There's inexperience in youth. There's a lot of growth to be needed, and I'm right there. I need a lot of growth in my life. But we also worship wealth like that will satisfy you. We also worship fame like that will satisfy you. Man, uh, I, I don't have wealth. I have a little bit of youth. I'm about to turn 30 in, in a month or two, so I guess I'm young. But the fame aspect, I guess there's you know a level of being known, but I know from that, there, there's no satisfaction. If anything, there's a loneliness that comes with it, and there's a lot of attacks that come with that too. But what I think is so sad is that we lift these things up like that's what will make us happy. I'm telling you, and you, it's so easy to see that that won't make you happy. All you have to do is turn on the news. If all those things made you happy, then every time you turned on E! Entertainment or the Hollywood News, you would just see happy people with no problems. But it seems like they have the most problems. It seems like we hear another celebrity overdose or a fallen marriage or fallen career, these things. Why? Because even at the pinnacle of everything the world has to offer you, it still doesn't meet the need. And they just keep thinking just a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. I heard Floyd Mayweather, you know, the big fight with Conor McGregor and all that. And, and I heard Floyd Mayweather talk and someone said, you really love money, don't you? When will it be, be enough? And he said, the next dollar. I mean, hundreds of millions you have, the next dollar is going to satisfy you. The ne- and what he was saying is, it's not. I just need the next and the next. And, it's, and it just will never fill you up. And Jesus is saying, lady, you have sin in your life that you keep thinking will fill you up, but it still hasn't. You keep drinking dead things in a dead world, and then he calls her out on it later. But what I can give you is living water, and when I give you living water, you'll never thirst again, and you'll never want the things of this world, because it will grow strangely dim, that's what the old hymn says, strangely dim in your eyes, because I'll be so bright, you'll follow the light of the world. The only thing that will satisfy you, and young people hear me when I tell you, the only thing that will satisfy your life is Jesus. And now, right now, is the time to follow him. And to point other people to him. I often say that there's a puzzle piece missing in our life. It's a void, but it's Jesus-shaped. And when Jesus covers that up, you're complete, you're whole, you're made new. And what took that out in the first place? It's what I talked about earlier, sin. It separated us from our creator. And sin is what destroys. And sin is what this lady had. But Jesus still loves sinners. And I'm so thankful for that. And then this is what happens in verse 15. If you're following along with the scripture, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come all the way here to draw water. Uh, I I, I think it's so interesting that that Jesus, uh, he's pointing out sin before he starts to talk about salvation. What he's saying is, you know, the stuff that you're drinking will 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 never fill you up. What's he talking about? Sin. You can never understand your need for a savior unless you understand that you're a sinner separated from him. You'll never take cure, uh, medicine to cure cancer unless you understand you've been diagnosed with cancer, correct? And the problem with a lot of preaching today is people only talk about grace. Well, grace is only beautiful because of the sin that keeps us from a relationship with Jesus in the first place. The good news is only good because the bad is so terrible. 
And then so Jesus always points out the bad, but then says, but there's good news. If you love people, you'll tell them both sides. And that's what I'm hoping to, to do tonight, to tell you that there's sin in your life, uh, that sin separates you from God, but there's an answer. So the lady, all of a sudden, she wants it. You can tell she's curious, and she's like, okay, yeah, I need this water. I don't want to come all the way here. And, and, and we have to pause on that right there because there's, there's a little nugget of truth here, and it tells the backstory. Because remember what she said, she said, so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. There's one well. It's, it's the well of Jacob that's been placed there. There's one well that she keeps coming to, right? My question is simple. Why is she the only one at the well with Jesus? I mean, surely there's other thirsty people in that town. Because when I asked all of you if you've drank something today, you all raised your hand. At some point today, you've all been thirsty. So why is it that it's only her with Jesus? Because she went at the time of day when she knew no one else would go there. She knew this is the point of time of day when no one else is going to be here. It'll just be me, and I can slip in and slip out. That, that begs the question right there. Why would you not want to be around anybody? I mean, don't you understand? Jesus is just, he's like peeling away the layers of, of her heart, and he's so good at that. He just, shoo, 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 shoo. here you are. And guess what you need? Me. That's what he does every time. And so what he's saying is, okay, listen, you are telling your own tale like you're putting your cards on the table because you just said come all the way here to draw and you're by yourself. Nobody else is here. So why are you the only one coming at the time of day when no one else is here? Because she didn't want to be seen by anybody, which means she was ashamed. It means she didn't want to be around anybody because she had regret in her life. And she was tired of being mocked, and she was tired of being gossiped about, and she was tired of being put down, and she was tired of being called names. And if we're being honest with each other, that's happened to all of us at some point in life. You've had people say things about you, put you down, call you names, you know, hurl things your way and say things about you. And the temptation really when that happens is either one, to lash back out and retaliate, which that's not, don't do that, that's not of God. Uh, but the other temptation is to just curl up and just hide away. God's never called you to be people who hide. He's called you to be fierce. You know, the righteous are as bold as lions. He's called you to step out. But he's also called you to die to yourself and to understand that your reputation, your, you, you don't matter in the equation as much as he does. We, we don't defend yourself. Who cares about you? It's about him. And lower yourself, he'll lift you up. You don't have to defend yourself to anybody in the things they say about you. You used to be, you be silent, and the Bible says God will fight for you. Even when it's hard, be quiet. Let God fight for you. But she's ashamed, and she's so ashamed that she's decided to do this and to steal away. But the question is, why is she ashamed? Well, Jesus doesn't miss a beat. Boom, he goes right at the heart of things. And this is what he says in verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. And, I, and what Jesus is saying is, I'm about to expose your sins. Notice that Jesus is about to expose her sins privately, one-on-one. -on -one. That's how God operates. Uh, people don't operate that way. Did you hear what so-and-so did? You won't believe this. Let me tell you that. Instead of going to them one-on-one, -on -one, that's what brothers and sisters should be doing. You know, I imagine if you're on a battlefield and, and one of your friends has a kink in his armor and you know he's, he's gotten wounded right here, who in the world would ever run to the enemy and say, my friend right here just got shot? That's his weak spot. Take him out. But that's what Christians do all the time. Well, I say Christians. Just because someone calls himself a Christian doesn't mean they're a follower of Jesus. No, that's what we do. But instead, Jesus doesn't do that. I don't read anywhere that it says he logged on Facebook and talked about her. It's just not there. Instead, he talks to her individually, one-on-one, -on -one, and he's not exposing her sins to shame her. He's bringing them to light to save her, right? Because how's she going to know she needs a cure if she doesn't know she has the disease? So Jesus says, listen here, call your husband and come here. Jesus knows what she's about to say because she says in verse 17, I have no husband. Well, was Jesus wrong in saying, call your husband to come here? Did he just get it wrong? Did he just call it wrong? No, no way. He knows why. And Jesus says, listen, you're right in saying that you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. 
Jesus says, I know about all the sins in your life. I know why you're so ashamed. I know why you're hiding out from everyone in your town. I know why you're coming here when no one else is here and I know why you're by yourself and I know that you're beat down and I know that you're lonely and I know that Satan has had his way accusing you and putting you down and beating you. I know all these things. I also know that I love you. I also know that not a short, not too long from that point, I'll one day go to a cross for you to pay the price of the sins that you've committed because I love you that much. And Jesus is saying, I'm willing to talk to you one-on-one -on -one when no one else will because instead people would want to put you down. I'm willing to do that. Why? Because I am love. That's what Jesus is. Jesus says, you're right. Yeah, you, you don't have a husband and, and you've had five, right? And the one you now have that you're with, he's not even your husband. You're living in sin. I know those things, but guess what? I've not run away from you. I've walked up to you, and I'm meeting with you one-on-one -on -one to change your life. The gift is right here. What will you do with it? Then the lady says this, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And I think that's interesting because he's so much more, right? But she's like, you're calling out things in my life. You must be a prophet. Man, he's not just a prophet. He's the son of God. He's the reigning king. And one day he's coming back, and I believe he's coming back very, very soon. I mean, it could be tonight. You know, people say, why are you just traveling here, traveling there, preaching here, preaching there? And they'll ask Blake the same thing. And why are you going, going, going? Well, we believe Jesus is coming back very soon. Now, we've just been created to tell people he's coming back. Give him your life before time runs out. What I think was interesting was the, all the solar eclipse that captured news all around the United States and beyond. Everyone talking about the solar eclipse and looking up and looking up and looking up. And I said, man, there's coming another day and it's coming really soon where everyone's going to look up and they're going to be far more shocked than the solar eclipse. They're going to look up and the sky will have split and Jesus will have returned. And I believe it's going to happen soon. But that same Jesus is here and he's meeting with this woman. And Jesus talks to her. And what happens is she has her entire life changed with one conversation with Jesus. And some of you think the circumstance that I'm in right now, it's going to take me a year to get out of this, two years, 10 years. Man, I'm a work in progress. 20 years from now, maybe God will have changed my life. He changed this woman's life in one conversation. Don't tell me he can't change your life in one service or in one day. That's the type of God he is. He moves quickly. Because he loves you and time is running out. So he talks to the lady. They have the conversation. And then what happens? If you read on in that passage, she goes into the town. She gets so fired up. Here's what's amazing about that. She was the same lady, right? The scripture tells us was hiding. She was hiding, right? And now all of a sudden, she's not hiding anymore. Instead, she's running. She's running. And she's running right out into the town. She goes out into this town. The town was Woodstock, uh, Vermont. I'm joking. I don't know. She runs right out into the town, and she starts telling people, you will not believe this man. He knew everything about me. And all of a sudden, she can't stop talking about him. And what happens is she tells people, you got to come meet him. You got to come meet him. And when, and when people listen, because they're so, they're so captivated by by her convinced state that this man is the Messiah, that they go meet Jesus, and when they meet Jesus, revival breaks out in that town. And one person gets saved, and another person gets saved, and another person gets saved. And we can take two things from that ending right there. Number one, we can take this. We can take the fact that you are called to tell other people about what God has done in your life. You know? Uh, someone recently got saved in Florida. He owns a big surf shop down there, and he asked me to come to a store after a revival in Panama, and I went there, and he said, man, you know, I'm so fired up for Jesus, but an older believer told me I need to tone it down a little bit because I'm telling all my customers about Jesus. And I said, tone it down? We're never called to tone it down. We're called to turn it up. Tell more people and tell more people and tell more people about Jesus. Because if you have an experience with a living God, how could you not tell other people what happened in your life? If you're not telling people, then did it really happen? I mean, if it did, you couldn't help but shout it from the rooftops. Tell everyone you come into contact with. And some of you will say, man, that's just not my call. I'm more of the timid behind the scenes person. Well, the Bible says that the Great Commission is for all people. 
go into the world and make disciples. It's on all of us, not just the evangelists, not just the pastors. It's on you and your, and your local community and the people you see at the grocery store and your friends at school and the people in the workplace that you have. It's on all of us to tell them about Jesus. And the excuse that I don't want to make them uncomfortable is not a good excuse. It's, not, it's a horrible excuse because I promise you this, just as sure as I'm standing here, they will be extremely uncomfortable when they leave this world without Jesus and wake up in an eternity in hell separated from God forever. And in that uncomfortable state, you know who they'll think about? The people who never told them about Jesus. I'll say, why didn't they ever tell me? So I figure, man, make people uncomfortable now in hopes of saving them from an eternity of, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's what the Bible says about hell. Tell people about Jesus. I say, tell the world. That's for all of us. Tell the world. We can also take from that ending another thing I think is beautiful. That this woman who had been with five men, this woman who had a history of, of adultery, a history of, of, of all of this sin in her life, that's who God used. So my challenge to you is this. Don't ever think because the sins in your past that you uh, are not qualified for God to use you. you know, first off, you're not qualified ever on your own, but you're qualified through him. Yeah. He uses broken people. He uses the least of these. And if, and if Jesus in that moment used a whore, if we're being honest, to spark a revival in that town, then he can use you as well in this town and in your communities and in your workplaces, and in your schools, and wherever you're from, and your families too, your families who need Jesus as well. She got bold. And when you get bold, man, nothing can stand in your way. You just keep roaring the gospel and telling people about Jesus and telling people about Jesus. Uh, I fly home tomorrow, and uh, you know, I fly home tomorrow, and if, if Blake and I flying home we're, we're hit by another plane as we're flying. Boom. I pray that doesn't happen. But let's say, boom, we hit by another plane. And listen, death is an upgrade, though. So, But boom, let's say that happened. But I survived it, right? And, and I go home, and, and, and I'm at the house, and Jamie, my wife, walks up to me, and she says, how did the trip home go? And I say, it was cool, but we were hit by a plane in midair, like, boom, boom. And other than that, it was cool. And then she looked at me, and she's like, wait a minute. Like, there's no scars on you. There's no bruises. There's no debris. There's no signs of that impact ever happening. I don't believe you. But people say that the God of the universe, boom, impacted their life, right? And why is it that so many people, you don't see one trace of the evidence of having an experience being impacted by God? If you've had an experience head on, boom, with the grace of God, the mercy of God, Jesus moving in your life, it should be written all over you. Everywhere you go, people say, what happened to you? Man, wh why are you living like this? How are you so fired up? Where does this passion come from? Where does this love come from? Where does this forgiveness and love for your enemies come from? Tell me where it comes from. It comes from me having an impact with a holy God at my lowest point. That's where it comes from. Is that true in your life? Now I want to challenge you. To make it true. And they say, God, give me that fire. Give me that passion. Give me that all-consuming love for you and love for your people. Because that's the greatest of all things, to love God and to love people. Give me that, God, so that I can be used as a catalyst of revival. Do you want God to use your life? He uses the willing. Not the talented. Not the ones who say, man, yeah, I've got all my degrees. I'm ready to go because it's on me. He says, no, I want the ones where I get the glory for it. Yeah. I just want the willing. I just want the available. Or just our, Their hands are like this, like, use me, God. And when you say, use me, God, he will use you in powerful ways more than you could ever have imagined. So this woman has an experience with Jesus, and because of it, she's changed and she's saved. So I'm looking at all of you tonight, and I don't know really any of you, but what I do know is that God knows all of you. And my question is simple. Uh, what are you doing with Jesus? Because the same Jesus that met with this woman at the well and said, hey, listen, stop drinking dead things in a dead world and instead follow me is also telling you tonight the same thing. 2,000 years later, he, he talked to her knowing that here tonight you would be hearing his words back then. And the same words that were spoken to her are applied to your life. 
And he's saying, stop, stop, stop. And instead, follow, follow, follow. Are you doing that? Are you doing that? And I'm not asking you if at some point in your life you raised your hand for Jesus at some event or you heard an evangelist and said, yep, or, or a youth group thing. What I'm asking you is simple. Is Jesus first place in your life? You say, I want to know if I'm saved. All right, simple. Is he first place in your life? Is he above everything? Do you love him more than you love your family? You love him more than the things you have in this world, than the jobs? Is he first place? Because if Jesus is not first place in your life, you have to ask yourself, is he in your life at all? You say, man, that's pretty blunt and bold. That's what Jesus said, not me. He said, if you love your family more than me, you're not worthy of me. And Jesus said, I came with a sword, not to bring peace, but to divide. What does that mean? To divide families. You're, hey, listen, mom and dad, I'm following Jesus. I don't care anymore. I'm following Jesus. If this means our relationship's divided, I'm following Jesus. It means stepping out, being different, and making him Lord. But we think, hey, we'll just put him in our back pocket, and we'll just slip along, live our lives, slip into heaven. It doesn't work like that. He's saying to her, stop what you're doing and follow me. My challenge for you is whatever you're living for in this life that's not Jesus, stop doing it. It's not worth it. And it's not a thing of rules and regulations to beat over your head like, stop, you're bad. Instead, it's saying, it's not worth it. God has so much more for you. It's never going to satisfy you. It's never going to fulfill you. It's the tricks of Satan. It's the tricks of the enemy. And one day, very soon, You'll wake up separated from God and say, why did I not just live for you when I had the opportunity? I don't want that for you guys. I don't want that for anybody. What are you going to do with Jesus? You know, you hear that story of the, uh, of the woman at the well, right? And you say, man, why does, you know, what's taking her so long? Why doesn't she just grab a hold of Jesus and say, I'm following you? Well, what's taking you so long to give away the idols in your life? To die to yourself, and those relationships that are, are wrong, to get rid of them, you know, those secret addictions nobody knows about, to, to cut them off. And you say, I'm not strong enough to do it. Well, you're right about that. But when you give it to God, he's strong enough through you. Yeah. And he does the work. You don't do the work. You just submit to him and you follow him and he begins to clean you and change you. He says, come as you are, but leave different than you came. That's what Jesus wants in your life. And he can heal you. I promise you that. You can change your life. I was preaching, uh, I don't even remember where it was at now, but I met a lady, and, um, and, and the lady was very unattractive. Her hair was falling out. Her teeth were falling out. Uh, she, just, she was wearing raggedy clothing, and she stood in front of me, and she didn't smell good. And she said, uh, here, I want you to see this picture. She handed me the picture, and the picture was this beautiful blonde lady, uh, younger. And I said, oh, wow, is this your daughter? And she said, no, that, that's me before the meth. And it was just like, whew, like took the wind out of my chest. It was like a visualization of what sin does to people. It'll just take you further than what you want to go, and it'll keep you longer than you want to stay. It'll just destroy your life. And it's the schemes of Satan just to see what she was and who God made her and what Satan had done. And that's the thing that I'm trying to talk to you about tonight. Everything that you drink in an empty world will never fill you up, but come to Jesus and he's living water and you'll never thirst again. You know what's so, what's so cool? I think it's verse 28 in that passage. I don't remember for certain, but later in the passage, there's just one little quick sentence and it slipped in there and this is so cool because everything that slipped in there, right, has purpose and meaning. And at the very end, it slipped in there and it says, she left her water pot at the well. Like, cool, we don't get it. Like, you just, you're just you setting the story up. You're giving us a visual. She left her water pot at the well. Don't you understand that that's a perfect description of what repentance looks like? Because Jesus used the, that, the water, and everything to come and scoop it up. He was talking about that as if it was sin, right? In its context. So now she leaves the water pot there because she has no need for it. And what Scripture is trying to tell us is once you come and have an experience with Jesus, you don't need the stuff of this world to satisfy you more. And you say, well, then how, how can I do that, man? It was simple. She just left it with Jesus. It never said she went to a 10-step program after that or an eight-way motivational speech to live right or having a great life now book. Like, she didn't do any of that junk. She just went to Jesus and left her water pot and followed. 
The call to go and tell people about Jesus, it's so simple. Repentance is simple. I'm walking this way and I'm living in sin. Boom, I'm not living in that sin anymore and I'm going this way instead. And you just leave it with Jesus. So you say, man, I want to be changed. I want to be fulfilled. I want to be satisfied. I, I want help from these addictions. I need change in my life. Clayton, how do I do it? One place, one place, one place, the cross of Jesus Christ. You go there, you leave your sin, and you follow Jesus because he's not on the cross anymore. And that's where he paid the price, though. You say, you already paid the price for these sins. I'm leaving them here, and I'm following you. Have you been there? You can tonight. That's the amazing thing, man. The gospel is for all people, you and me, you and me, and all people. I guess the reason I'm so burdened and um, the reason I want, some, the reason I, I want everyone to know this is because I believe Jesus is coming back, yes, and coming back soon. But I believe that if Jesus died for us, then we better live for him. And I got to tell you that Jesus is not asking you to follow him. Because here's a reality check for you. He doesn't need you. Yeah. He doesn't need me either. He's not asking us. He's telling us. He's commanding us. He doesn't say, hey, consider following me. Go talk it over and put a pros and con list and then whatever works out, decide. He says, come follow me. It's a demand. He says, you are my creation. I purchased you, and it took my blood, and it took my sweat, and it took all of the lashes and the whips and the spit and the mockery, and it took me experiencing the wrath of God because the sin that came on me that was yours. It took all of that, and now I'm demanding you, give me your life. I purchased it. So there's one of two ways. You can live your life for you, you do it your way, and then pay the price for it, or submit to Jesus, bow the knee and say, I need you. And when you do that, your life will be changed forever. Is he Lord of your life or is he not? It's just so simple. So all of you where you're at, just stand to your feet, would you? This is, a, this is the moment of decision, right? I mean, it would not be any, there'd be no purpose of me coming all the way to Vermont and then talking to you about Jesus and, and going over these things with you and then just being like, all right, cool, see you later. No, there's always a decision to be made. What will you do? You have to act on it. And last night when I preached in New Jersey, we saw people get saved, but then some out there that, that I spoke to said, yeah, I'm just thinking about it and we'll deal with it later. Well, you've already decided. You've walked away. You've walked away. I preached... Uh, I preached a revival service, and, uh, and a lady came to me after the service, and I remember she walked up to me, and, um, and she said, my husband doesn't like you, and I said, nice to meet you too, <laughs> but she just straight, straight up, my husband doesn't like you, and I said, oh, okay, and she said, she said yeah, it's the message that you preach, he, it's, it's Jesus, he, he doesn't like religion, I said, well, that makes two of us, but keep going, she said, well, no, uh, he doesn't like the fact that you're telling him to, to, that he needs to ask forgiveness of God because he believes God's done him wrong throughout life. He just doesn't like your message. And she said, here's the thing, though. I've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that he would give his life to Jesus. I've prayed and prayed and prayed. And I've prayed that he would attend one Christian service with me, and he never has. But he came tonight. And I said, oh, okay, well, where is he? And she said, he's out in the truck right now. He's upset. He left. She said at the altar call, when you gave it, and it was a great, great, great altar call, great God brought people. She said he was in the back, and he stood up alongside of me, and he started to walk forward, and my heart leapt, and I thought, this is it. He's getting saved. And then he walked out the side door and went to his truck. And she said, my heart just sunk. And I said, okay, he's in the truck. She said, yep. I said, well, after the service, I'm going to go out there, and, and I'm going to pray with him. So don't let him leave. Don't let him leave. So the service ended. And I walked outside, and he was gone. Uh, the, the meet and greet ended. I walked outside. He was gone. He was gone. It was a short time later. I was preaching in another state, and there was another meet and greet line. And that same lady walked up to me, and she stood in front of me, and I said, hey, wait a minute. I remember you. If he's hiding in the truck, like I'm going out there right now, let's just do this thing. But then I just remember she just began to weep. 
And she just about collapsed. She just fell like this. And she just kept saying, and through her tears, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. And come to find out, the day after he walked out of that original service and got in his truck and decided he was going to go his own way, the very next day, he walked into his job at a factory, and he fell flat on his face with a massive heart attack, and he died. I can't get that out of my head, man. And now I always think, like, preaching to people, you look at people and you just think, like, man, how long do they have? Do they know Jesus? You know, my dad used to tell me that, Clayton, as an evangelist, you're standing on the precipice of hell and you're begging people not to go over. That's all I'm doing. I beg people, don't go over, man, don't go over. God has such a great plan for your life. He paid the price. Don't do it. Hmm. But then I preached in another state, and a lady walked up to me, and she said, my husband's upset at you. He doesn't really like your message. And I said, oddly enough, I've heard this before. (laughs) I said, where is he? She said, he's in a truck outside. And then I said, I've heard that before as well. But this time I'm telling you, you're not allowed to leave, because I don't want him to go. So you just stay right here. Let me finish this line. I want you to stay here. Please just hear me out. She said, I'll stay. So we finished the line, and then I had a pastor, and this was in Virginia, and pastor and some of the elders were with me, and we walked outside with her, and she pointed out one of the last cars in the parking lot, and it was a four-door, big, big truck type thing. And as we walk up to it, she said, I just want to warn you, he's very big and very aggressive. And I said, thank you for the encouragement. And I said, let's just do this thing. I opened up the back door as they stood outside and prayed, and I just jumped in the car with them. And I said, what's up, man? And then he cussed me out, and he didn't want to even be anywhere near me. And I said, before you beat me up, just hear me out for a second. The only reason I've come out here is because I've seen this play out before. And I saw another man who went, and he was upset, and he lost his life short time after that. And I don't want to see that to happen to you. So just tell me. What is it about the gospel that doesn't strike a nerve of conviction in your life? What is it about Jesus that keeps you from giving everything away? And he told me, he opened up, and he said, I've been hurt by people in the church when I was a kid in a horrible way. And this big, burly man all of a sudden started to get a soft heart as I talked to him. And I told him what I'll tell you. Just because you've been hurt by religious people doesn't mean you've been hurt by Jesus. And in that car, the walls came down in his life, and he wept, and he cried out to God, and he got saved. And then the next day, he and his wife drove three hours back to the second night of the crusade, and we baptized him. So what I always think about is this. There's two men. Two different paths, two different eternities. Two people in this world, two types. People who are on the narrow path, people who are on the broad road. And everyone in this room right now, including me, is on one of those two paths. Which path are you on? And if you want to know for certain that you're on the right path, give your life to Jesus. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you'll be saved. And you follow him. Lord of your life. And the reason I came here tonight was to tell you that. And to tell you the only way to be forgiven of your sins is to give your life to Jesus. And at that moment, boom, no longer will God see you as a sinner who must be punished, but rather as a son or a daughter who is covered because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. And you can be saved right now, man. So bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. If you want to give your life to Jesus tonight, you want to know for certain that when you leave this world, you have a home in heaven, then you pray this after me right now, and you say these words, and no magical prayer will ever save you, but a heart cry from you to God will. And the Bible says anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, and God is meeting with us tonight, and you know who you are. You say, man, this is my time. You pray after me right now, and you give your life to Jesus. And you say these words, Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, but I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I repent of my sins. I trust in you. 
I'm following you. I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for making me new. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you tonight who say, man, I've given my life to Jesus before. I just walked away and I need to rededicate my life. Then you can pray right now and rededicate your life to Jesus and have a fresh start. And you pray this. Dear Lord, forgive me. I'm coming home. Use my life. Make me new. Give me purpose. Change my heart. I need you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So I want everyone to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed real quick. Just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Only I can see you. I want to ask you a question. If you got saved tonight, you said, tonight I gave my life to Jesus, or you rededicated your life, raise your hand so I can see you, just so I can see you. Look at that. Okay. All right, you can lower your hands. Now everybody open your eyes and look up. So the same people, and there was a bunch of you all around, that said tonight your life was changed. You either got saved or rededicated. You were bold, but no one was watching. Jesus was bold for you when everybody was watching. So I'm asking you to do the same thing for him. So if you got saved tonight or you rededicated your life tonight, raise your hand again. Just put it straight up. Look at that right there. Praise God, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. So here's what I want. <clears throat> All of you, that, that, you, that was me, you, you raised your hand. Come here right in the middle. Come stand around me. Somebody might need to throw me a mint. I had Taco Bell earlier. I might, I might mess you up. Come in here. You say, you say you got saved tonight. You rededicated. Come in, come in, come in. And now all of you from out there. Uh, now all of you link arms. Link arms, link arms, link arms. Now all of you out there. You guys come in, come in, come in. All of you guys out there. Come towards them and, and put your hands on them. Cool? Put your hands on them. Cool? So we're just going to pray for you. And we're going to pray that God uses your life, touches your life, empowers you. Uh, for those who said, man, this is my first time with this whole Jesus thing, and, and man, I'm sold out. Where do I do next? You get plugged into a local church that teaches the Word of God. You get baptized there. You read the Bible every day. The book of Mark and the book of John, those are great books to start in. You pray every day. And you talk to the Lord, and you grow. Healthy things tend to grow, and you'll be healthy when you live in that system that he's created for you. But well, we love you so much. It's family here. It's family. All right, so I want all of you to bow your heads. Go ahead, bow your heads. Keep your hands on them. And we're going to pray for them, okay? We're going to pray for them. But here's the thing. Why just have me talk? I've talked a lot tonight. So why don't you all pray out loud for them? We're going to pray for them together. Pray that God protects them, blesses their life, and pray that God uses them to impact others. So all of you right now, let's just be bold. Let's pray out loud. And those of you who've gotten saved, you're, you've gotten saved or rededicated, you pray too. And you thank the Lord for what he's done in your life. And you pray too. So let's all pray together. Come on. Lord, I just thank you for Lord. And I thank you for saving people's lives. And I thank you, Lord, for the work that you've done tonight. I pray that you bless these people. I pray that you bring them closer to yourself. I pray for revival to break out in this town and in this state and in this country. And I pray, Lord, that you move my government in our schools. And I pray, Lord, that you bless our friends, that you remind them of their family, Lord, no condemnation, no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Use our lives, Lord. Use these people. Raise them up. And let tonight be the catalyst of revival in this place. Please, in this Jesus, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 And I'm just going to close us in prayer. And then, would, uh, Nate, did you have something planned for after I speak? Uh, we'll play some worship music. Cool. We'll do that. Let me pray for you real quick. Lord, I, I, I pray for these people. And I pray, Lord, for your blessing on their lives. Uh, I pray, God, that no attacks from the enemy will prevail against them. I pray that no discouragement from religious people will, will come against them but rather that you in your light and in your truth will stand as their shield and as their guard. And I pray, God, that you protect their families. And I pray that tonight, you use tonight for the salvations that happen tonight, that you begin to raise up people who go forth powerfully to proclaim the gospel. I pray for revival to stir in this place, to stir in this state, a state, Lord, that, that, that mostly has nothing to do with the things of God. 
but a state, Lord, that I believe that you can work in because you move where you're least expected. And I pray for revival to begin here in Vermont. And I pray that you use these people to be catalysts of it as they shout the gospel. Use their lives. We give you all the glory and we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. amen.